Hello, everyone, and good morning. We are back here today with another webinar series. Uh, for those of you that do not know me or have not tuned into any of our previous webinars, my name is Kara Oosterhuis, and I'm the Western Canadian Agricultural Field Editor at Real Agriculture. Uh, I am also a University of Calgary Media and Communication Studies grad, so it's pretty cool to be back here and to be able to talk to you guys, um, especially with the new John Simpson Center. So I am, like I said, I'm pleased to host today's webinar for the Simpson Center for Agricultural and Food Innovation and Public Education at the School of Public Policy. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have a very timely and important topic today. Water resources in Alberta add value to many industries. The provincial government recently announced its support of irrigation projects as a key sector in the economic recovery of Alberta post COVID. Uh, we will have three speakers on here today and they will delve into the topic of the added value of irrigation to Alberta's agriculture industry, in addition to the competing pressures on Alberta's water resources, the systems used to manage it in a sustainable manner, and related policy implications. As I said earlier, we have three speakers today and we'll hear from them first before going into the Q&A. So it'll be set up that first we'll, like I said, we'll hear three different series. Um, but feel free if you have questions, we, you can put them into the Zoom box at the bottom of the screen. So please, like I said, put them in at any time, we'll see them. And after all three presentations are done, we will be able to go into a Q&A um, &A series. If you have any specific questions for any of the panelists, please feel free to uh, indicate as so. And if not, we will address your question to the whole panel. First off, to start off our panel, I'd like to introduce Mr. Alex Ostrop, and he's chair of the Alberta Irrigation Districts Association. Hi there, Kara. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the Simpson Center for putting on this webinar. Thank you to everybody out there listening to what is a very important topic. I'm an irrigation farmer uh, in the Grassy Lake area, which is between Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. I'm a board member of the uh, St. Mary's River Irrigation District, and as Kara mentioned, the chair of the Alberta Irrigation Districts Association, which is a, a group representing all the irrigation districts in Canada, so, uh, sorry, in Alberta. So the, uh, the question in front of us today is, does Alberta have enough water to grow? Uh, before getting into the question, I just wanna provide a little bit of background and speak to the role of uh, irrigation and water in Alberta's agriculture. Uh, and then the role of that irrigated agricultural business in Alberta. So currently we have about four point, um, sorry, we, we have about 1.7 million acres uh, under irrigation uh, in Alberta. And that represents about 4.7% of the irrigated, oh, sorry, of the land base in the province. So that uh, land base there, represents 20% of all the agricultural GDP in this province. In other words, irrigated agriculture outperforms dryland agriculture by a factor of four to five and contributes about $3.6 billion into Alberta's uh, economy by, by way of GDP. It allows, irrigation allows agriculture in Alberta to be not just a commodity business. Um, it allows for value added processing whether it's potatoes or sugar beets or beans or peas. Um, there's, there are processors that are uh, specifically in Southern Alberta, but throughout the province. There's a vibrant seed business and irrigation also allows for the cattle industry to exist and thrive in this, pro in this province. Uh, agriculture, the irrigated agriculture also has a non-direct benefit uh, for the province insofar as that many communities, especially south of Calgary, would not be able to exist without the infrastructure, the water infrastructure that is provided through agriculture that supplies those communities with water. And there's a quality of life benefit. What most people see as lakes around Calgary and in the prairies to the south of it are actually irrigation reservoirs that allow for fishing and camping and recreation. Um, uh, and then lastly, irrigation also plays a huge role in uh, flood mitigation. The infrastructure that is used and irrigation is part of the plan to uh, mitigate flood waters by channeling them, diverting them, and storing them in the case of a flood event. But back to the question of whether Alberta has enough water to grow. Um, I'm going to break that down into two components. The first one is, does the current water supply enjoyed by Albertans 
uh, allow for sustainable growth in this province? The answer there is an unequivocal yes. We are not using um, anywhere near the amount of water that is allocated to Alberta. If we look at uh, the South Saskatchewan uh, River, um, we have a treaty with Saskatchewan pursuant to which 50% of the natural flows uh, are allocated to Alberta and 50% continue through to Saskatchewan and depth further downstream. We've never used anywhere near that 50% allocation. On an average year, uh, about 70 uh, to 75% of the water flows through to Saskatchewan. So in the current situation, yes, there is definitely enough water for uh, Alberta to grow. Um, the second part of that question, perhaps, or a different take on that question, is that the anticipated future water availability uh, that uh, we can expect allow for our sustainable growth? This one is more tricky. And again, my answer is going to be, yes, it does, but it's a qualified yes. Uh, and so far as for that to happen sustainably, we need to manage our water effectively. As a farmer down here in, in Southern Alberta and dry Southern Alberta most of the time. Um, when it comes to water, there are two issues that, that concern me. I either have too much water or I have too little water. Climate change is only going to exacerbate those two scenarios. With the increase of severe weather events, we're going to be uh, running into either too much water or too little water more often. And the, uh, the best way to address that is to really focus on, uh, if there's too much water, we need to focus on having the infrastructure in place to capture that water, store it, channel it, um, divert it away from vulnerable areas. And that is something that the irrigation districts in the South have been working on for a number of years now. Uh, the SMRID, which is the district where I'm a board member, it's the largest of Canada's irrigation districts. Uh, we have several agreements in place with various municipalities and uh, uh, and uh, communities where, pursuant to which we are in agreement as to how we take uh, uh, and relieve some of the pressure uh, in case of a flood event. So we're working on that. We're working on that with Alberta Environment. We're working on that with uh, uh, regional municipalities. And it is something, it is a role that we as, as irrigators uh, take seriously is how do we, um, how do we capture the water in case of an excess water event and prevent it from causing damage where uh, it's not desired. And we see that as a scenario that is obviously increasing. We've seen several major flood events in the last decade as, as everyone listening I'm sure knows. In the case of too little water, there are, there are two things that we need to do. We need to improve our water use efficiency and we need to improve the ability to capture and store the water that does exist. When it comes to uh, improving our efficiency, um, uh, we as irrigation districts and irrigators have been working on that uh, uh, for quite some time. And just as an example, between the period of 2005 and 2050, we've seen an, a 48% improvement in efficiency. Overall, during that time in Alberta, we've used 26% less water on significantly more acres. And that efficiency was gained by investments on the farm and at the irrigation district level um, with respect to converting ditches which had seepage and evaporation to pipelines with converting irrigation from first flood irrigation and then high pressure irrigation systems to low pressure irrigation systems. So a lot of investment has gone into making uh, the uh, uh, increasing the efficiency of the water that we as a farmer and that we as an irrigation district have available. The second one is the second component of how to deal with too little water is to improve our ability to capture and store water. Uh, in that, specifically, I'm talking about obviously uh, uh, reservoirs being able to store the water for those periods when we have a, uh, an excess level of water to use at a later uh, to use as a later date, and to do so effectively. Um, the focus right now is um, on off-stream reservoirs. That's necessitated not just out of environmental concerns. Uh, but also just by geography and logistics. And to use an off-stream reservoir and to do it sustainably, um, we have to look at how we bring that water back into the system. So us as a SMRID, the uh, St. Mary's River Irrigation District, we're converting um, our pumps in which are required to bring the water back into the system 
to net zero systems. Our largest reservoir right now is purely solar powered. Um, and we uh, are looking for any, any type of efficiency gains that we can, we can make there. So this of course requires a large investment. Uh, there has been the announcement recently by the Alberta government and the federal government with respect to the focus on and support of the irrigation uh, sector in this province. And we view that as, uh, as a great step and highly beneficial. We're very grateful that irrigation seems to have, um, seems to be in the focus and recognized as a leading contributor to the uh, province's economic growth plan. And we believe strongly that uh, with continued investment and continued focus on efficiency, that we do indeed have enough water uh, for this, uh, for Alberta to grow. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much, Alex. Um, it's always very interesting to get different perspectives and it's it's a large value chain. And like, I, I grew up in a Southern Alberta irrigation town. So I can I could say, yes, we, we would not be thriving without, without irrigation. But uh, to keep the webinar moving, we will now move on to Wim Veldman. Um, Wim, whenever you're ready, you may take it away. Thank you, Kara. And thank you to John Simpson and the Simpson Center. Simpson Center for organizing this webinar. I would like to talk about four or three areas. First, what are the regulatory limits on water usage? Secondly, what is our historic water availability and usage? Third, what is the impact of climate change on water? And then wrap up by answering the question, do we have enough water to grow? First, a little bit of history. And by the way, am I shown on the screen? I could only see Kara's name. No, not yet. Yep, you were showing on the screen just fine. Okay. Um, your presentation will show up as the main one and then you will be able to, uh, but I, I believe the audience can see you right now. Okay, so we can take the graph off for now, Kinga, and just keep my headshot on. Thank you. First of, all, first of all, a little bit of history. I think water is in my blood. I was born at three feet above sea level in the Netherlands. And so you can imagine that water management is key to the entire country. In 1961, our second year on the farm in Manitoba, we had a severe drought. We experienced that in 64, a couple of years later, we had severe flooding. My entire professional life has been involved for 50 plus years and water resources and working on rivers and projects almost all around the world. So I'd like to talk first about regulatory limits on water usage and talk a little bit about the highest level of regulatory limits and going down to the individual license limits. And Alex has already talked about the Alberta Saskatchewan Water Apportionment Agreement that was signed in 1969 as administered by the Prairie Provinces Water Board. The average natural, the average flow that we have passed, we being Alberta have passed to Saskatchewan from 70 to 2006 is 81% versus the regulated requirement of 50%. There's also some additional rules and regulations with respect to for certain flows at the border. Uh, as an example, if the flow is more than 3000 cubic feet per second, we have to pass a minimum of 1500 cubic feet per second. If the flow is less than 3000 cubic feet per second, we still have to pass a minimum of 50%. The second regulatory limit on water usage is that there are no interbasin water transfers permitted. That would be tempting if you look at where the water availability is versus where our shortages are and where our dry, drier precipitation numbers are. Third, which is an extremely important one, in 2006, a moratorium was imposed on the South Saskatchewan River Basin with respect to no new licenses since 2006. I can obtain a new license. However, it would be as a result of a transfer from an existing license that is no longer required or an existing license that is not fully required. When there is a water transfer, a license transfer in that manner, 10% of the licensed amount is reverted back to the Crown, to the province. Let's look at some individual conditions on licenses. And I just pulled the Eastern Irrigation District as an example. Number one, they have a 
a regulated condition in terms of the total volume of water that can be diverted per year. Secondly, there's diversion rates that are specified, maximum allowable diversion rates that are specified from the Bow River into their main canal at the, at the Bassano Dam. Thirdly, there's a very important minimum flow that has to be maintained downstream and over the Bassano Dam. In 1963, the license for the EID said that a minimum flow of 100 CFS had to be maintained downstream of the Bassano Dam. That in 2002 was increased to 400 cubic feet per second. And in the EID license, it's very clear and stated that at any time, the controller has a right to amend that minimum flow further. The EID is also able to, as part of their license, deliver a certain amount of water to municipal, commercial, industrial, habitat, and recreational uses. The total percent that is permitted in their license is actually less than 1% of their total licensed volume of water. Next, I would like to look at the historic water availability and usage. And first of all, this is a graph from 1970. From 1970 to 2018 of the total flow uh, the boat in the Bow River in Calgary. This is actually upstream of the Elbow River. And I just computed it for the months of April to September 30th. And you can see that there's certainly no trend, no obvious trend on an annual basis of the volume of flow that passes Calgary and the Bow River. Sorry, the second one is a seasonal graph where I plotted the, the April to September flow and I plotted it for a very dry year, 2001, 2013. And the comparison is interesting, but the main point that I'm trying to show here, and certainly Alex talked about the importance of storage. You can see that in May and June, which are high flow months, as well as the first half of July, when we get the higher flows, we get, uh, uh, the opportunity to store water for later on in the season when we need it. This graph, and Alex again talked about it, irrigation, the depth of water that has been put on the farms versus time, and you can see from 1980 to 2011 is one of the graphs that I looked at. There's a strong trend downward, i.e. less water being used. Alex talked about that in terms of uh, certainly lining of the irrigation canals, uh, reduce the seepage losses and uh, pipelines in places rather than canals. So there's a, as well as the low pressure pivots all lead to irrigation efficiencies. And the last graph, just a plot of the total amount of water used by the irrigation districts from 1976 to 2011 versus the current license allocation. So we can see that there is quite a gap between the total amount of water that we have been using in the last 20 or 30 years versus the licensed allocation, i.e. within the current licenses, there's certainly very significant room to grow with respect to the irrigation acreages. And that's all the graphs that I need to have up on there, Kinga, thank you. A quick comment too about historic water availability and usage is the city of Calgary, which is a million plus and expected to grow, of course, beyond that. In a 2006 report by a very well-known water scientist at the University of Alberta, talking about climate change and the impact on flows in the Bow River, he has a statement in May prove wise to keep population low. Uh, that's an interesting statement and I definitely would not agree with that in terms of the, that as a statement with respect to the water availability. In the last number of years, the current usage that Calgary water usage per capita is only 50% of the past usage. With respect to the downstream water users, downstream of the city of Calgary, only 15% on the average of the water that is taken out of the Bow River by the city of Calgary at their two main intakes, only 15% is not returned. 
i.e. 80 to 90 percent of the water is returned to the Bow River and available for uh, all the uses that we have downstream. Next area that I'd like to talk about a little bit is climate change and this can be a whole week of webinars, no doubt. And in a lot of my work, I'm involved in this uh, recently on a new bridge on Trans Canada Highway, we spent a lot of time talking about the impact of climate change on the design flow for the bridge. I've seen forecasts that predict lower flow. I've seen forecasts that predict higher flow. I've seen forecasts certainly that predict earlier flow. In 2001, uh, there was a Government of Canada report that even prior to 2001, the climate change was impacting uh, agriculture in Canada and resulted in reduced grain production in Canada. Well, I think if we look at the graphs of grain production since 2001, that certainly has not happened. With respect to, I think it's always worthwhile comparing climate change impacts to natural impacts. We know all about the dirty 30s. 1961, I mentioned the drought in Manitoba that we personally experienced and almost brought us to our knees dry land farming. 1998 to 2004 was a dry period. And we know that even before the dirty 30s, as per the records from John Palliser, there were some very dry and extended long growth periods in the 1800s. So the realities are, in my opinion, that climate change is, yes, it's there. I've done a lot of work in the Arctic, and I know the last five years the Arctic is warming up, but the climate change variations or the impact of climate change on flows are, in my opinion, less than that than the natural variations that we've all had to live with, whether we're irrigation farmers or dryland farmers. All climate change forecasts are uncertain, and I think it depends a lot on our reaction to climate change, our reaction to being good citizens in the world. I've worked in China and I've worked in India, and a simple fact is that if either one of those countries or both of those countries convert a lot of their coal-fired plants to natural gas, there would be a huge difference in forecast of CO2 in the future. Farmers, districts, and government recognize risk. Whether you're a dryland farmer, the risks are higher. If you're an irrigation farmer, those risks are also there. And that is well stated. So to wrap up, does Alberta have enough water to grow? I say yes, we have a robust regulatory process. Amendments are made from time to time. We've seen that amendments can be made in the future. Yes, we have water availability versus water usage versus licensed allocation as a result of increased efficiencies. And yes, we have adapted to natural climate variations, which are greater in my opinion than climate change impacts. Can we sit back and do nothing? No. As uh, Alex has mentioned, and one of my big areas of work is flood control, and I've done a lot of work in that and, and hydro. There's so many opportunities for multi-purpose usage of reservoirs. Right now, the Ghost Reservoir upstream of Calgary has a flood control purpose in the last five years that has been coordinated with Transalta, an agreement with Transalta. I know Calgary needs a flood storage reservoir upstream of the city. That would be an ideal opportunity to combine flood control with water storage for irrigation. So I believe strongly that we can manage our current and our predicted increased usage and still meet all of our regulatory limits uh, as stated uh, and the various water licenses. And with that, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you very much, Wim. Um, next up on our list is uh, Jason Unger. He is our last speaker today and he's the executive director and general counsel at the Environmental Law Center, an Alberta-based charity focused on legal education and environmental and natural resources law reform. Before I get uh, Jason to speak here, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, I'm already seeing a few coming in here, um, feel free to give them at, or ask them at any point. Um, like I said, just specify who they are for, if you'd like it addressed to the whole panel, and we will get to them right after Jason is done speaking. So with that, we look forward to listening to your talk, Jason, and you may take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Um, it's a, a 
prime time to talk about uh, some of the challenges we face in terms of environmental challenges and, and growth challenges with uh, the impacts of, uh, on, of the pandemic on our economy. Um, so the Environmental Law Centre is, is certainly focused on uh, looking at environmental accountability in our law and policy. And, and so that really kind of frames where I'm coming from on this issue. Uh, certainly, while the funding announcement is is no doubt a laudable announcement from uh, in terms of its economic impact, um, the decision has to also be uh, viewed within the the broader um, lens of environmental outcomes. Uh, if we're intensifying water use and and water storage, what are the potential impacts and risks that we might see on the landscape? And a, a fundamental question I think uh, that has to be answered is, and we haven't answered it yet, is what does sustainability look like? Um, economic sustainability versus environmental sustainability. And if going forward, I think there's there's a question around resource scarcity and increasing risks on a landscape level, so on a watershed level. So it's not just about irrigation, it's not just about uh, municipalities increasing sizes and that type of thing. It's a it's a growing pressure on uh, in-stream flows and that type of thing that might result in some impacts that we want to avoid. And the question becomes then, how do we adapt? And adaptation is often difficult. It's often uncomfortable and it's often forced. I think of how the current impacts of the pandemic is impacting our economy and, and that type of thing. And, and really, we've had to adapt and it, it is often uncomfortable and, and problematic. Um, and there's a lot of different intersections of, of life that are changing. Um, Alberta as a province has had to deal with that as well in terms of lower oil prices and, and how we adapt to that. Uh, but this is mostly an adaptation in, in an environment economic lens. And I think adaptation in an environmental context is even more challenging. Uh, our laws are typically framed with a focus on certainty, a focus on vesting certain rights for resource access. Uh, that's both in the letter of the law and in implementation of day-to-day -day decisions. So the question becomes, how can we adapt if these risks are being realized on the landscape? Um, so if we look at the challenges before us in this first slide kind of outlines the complexity and uncertainty uh, around water management generally. So groundwater, surface water interactions, land uh, land and water interactions, often land management is basically water management. And I'm sure irrigators know that more than anyone. Uh, the connection of ecosystems and hydrology is also an area where it's an evolving field of science. Uh, the questions around snowpack and glaciers, temperature within the streams, uh, precipitation patterns, all these things are current and future challenges and complex issues. Also in that vein, return flows in terms of quality and quantity is an ongoing uh, question of how, how we can manage this. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm sure ir irrigation is also concerned about this in terms of the quality of, of water that's coming onto their fields and, and that type of thing. And then also habitat connectivity and implications for how we do storage is also an issue. So let's see if I can control the... So certainly I think part of the, the, the context we have to look at is the projected changes in population and what that means for growth, uh, growth within sectors, but growth overall as well. Um, indications are that we're going to see population growth, obviously Alberta and Canada is a fantastic place to be. Um, and so how do, are we gonna manage that growth and the pressures that that, that brings um, on the landscape? And within this as well, there's the current reality that oftentimes in-stream objectives are not being met. Um, so if we look at the scientific needs of, of fisheries and that type of thing in, in our river ecosystems, Oftentimes, these aren't being met. For instance, the Old Man Dam, Old Man River. Sorry. Uh, similarly, at different times in in the past, in the recent past, we have seen where in-stream objectives or even water conservation objectives have not been met. So, 
we we need to ensure we're monitoring and and looking at the the various impacts on the stream and whether those impacts are are causing irreparable changes um, on the landscape. Similarly, and this has implications for later flows in the summer, we've seen that uh, thickness of glaciers continues, uh, for instance, the Pado Glacier is one example, uh, continues to diminish significantly. Uh, as, and, in, and for those of us who've been in the province for a long time, we've and visited the ice fields and that type of thing over the decades, uh, I think we see that firsthand. So what are the impact, impacts there? And then there's the future impacts or the potential future impacts. Uh, obviously there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And certainly this is going to take place in the construct of, of what our environmental flows we're looking for uh, modeled. This is a, is a graph from a University of Alberta group uh, that modeled uh, future supply uh, as well as estimated use along with environmental flows and scarcity around that. And certainly they see that in scenarios that there are considering environmental flows specifically, there are these issues of scarcity that are likely to arise. And when we look at the governance system itself, I think it's important to say, to acknowledge that our governance system was founded, uh, you think in the first in time, first and right system of our water allocation system. It was founded in, in an era where our concerns uh, are, and our understanding was fundamentally different. So this has led um, certain academics for sure. I mean, it's more of a theoretical approach in terms of how we deal with water governance generally. And the past has really been focused on, on, on the premise that we understand the uncertainty. And the future, I think, is, is perhaps going to where uh, we don't under, we admit that we can't understand the uncertainty in the future. And so how can we adapt our laws and our governance systems to deal with that uncertainty as it arises? How, how are we able to learn and adapt uh, in terms of how we respond to in environmental challenges. So in terms of our my own uh, or the Environmental Law Center's position on some of these issues, um, certainly I think the concern is that in a lot of our, our approaches, whether it's uh, things like canceling coal policies or, or other things, there's a watershed and ecosystem requirements and ecosystem services that need to be considered. So what are the ecosystem risks that we're placing on, on our environment through these policy decisions? Um, typically the environment is the first to, to kind of get the brunt of our, our decision-making processes. So some of the opportunities are, are certainly there to, to kind of start clarifying things in terms of uh, IFN stands for in-stream flow needs. Uh, so monitoring, reporting, and, and creating legal protections for base flows. And transfers of water allocations, making that process uh, more transparent and public. Uh, looking at watershed management and water management as a, as a more of a community-based or a, a watershed-based endeavor where there's a, an effort to make allocation uh, decisions or operational decisions in a way that's helpful. Uh, this is going to be challenging for sure if we do go down this road uh, because it, it it requires everyone to be open to uh, that dialogue, that discussion. And as I mentioned, adaptation is often uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and finally, I think if I have another one there, uh, integrating knowledge and precaution into our future pol resource policy decisions. Oftentimes we're, and not surprisingly right now, due to the pandemic and the economic uh, turmoil, I'll phrase it, in Alberta currently, uh, we're facing a lot of challenging questions around how we, we pay for services and all these other things and, and have our account, economy grow. Um, and so the, the measure of, of how we 
are environmentally sustainable, I would argue, is how we are able to integrate knowledge and and show a measure of precaution in these uh, resource management decisions going forward. And that basically sums up my brief comments and I look forward to the, the discussion. Awesome, thank you very much, Jason. So uh, now if I can get Wim and Alex to join back in, that would be terrific. And we have a, to start off our Q&A session here. And like I said, keep them flowing in. We got lots of questions, but we got lots of time. So uh, feel free to send them in. Um, our first question is for all three of you. So answer in what order you would please. But uh, the question is, I know there's farmland up in Northern Alberta as well. With climate change, do any of you have comments on expansion of farmland within Northern Alberta and the potential impacts on our water resources? Does anyone have comments on that? How far Is north? That... Go ahead, Wim. How far north? Because there's a, lo a lot of agriculture already in the Peace River area. I know in the last four or five years, the north has suffered from too much water starting at a line almost by Edmonton. And I know some people that live in that area. So uh, I think the north is quite variable. I know in the Peace River area, there's lots of farming already going on. I don't know anything more personally about farming up there in terms of uh, that I know they struggle sometimes with an early frost. Yeah, so I think climate change will impact agriculture in, in Northern Alberta, that uh, I have no doubt. Uh, as of uh, the current uh, time, there are no irrigation districts up there. So there are 13 irrigation districts in Alberta. All of them are Calgary and South. There's some private irrigation and some private water licenses up there, but they fall under a different regulatory framework um, so as, uh, as the uh, environment changes up there, uh, I'm sure that uh, the, the first step would be to provide some additional clarity there with respect to how those water uh, resources are used. But given the current situation, we don't have the regulatory framework up there through the Irrigation Districts Act um, or through uh, organized irrigation districts. So that, for the moment, is still very much a Calgary and South uh, issue, but uh, yeah, in, in time that may very well change. So um, does the, so there was recently, uh, as we all know, there's a recent uh, announcement for funding towards new irrigation systems. Um, does it go towards irrigation systems or does it only go towards improvement of existing infrastructure? So for example, replacing open canals with pipelines. So the, uh, the announcement that uh, came there, so there were two announcements. The one is a more annual announcement where uh, the government of Alberta uh, contributes to infrastructure rehabilitation. Um, that is something that has been going on um, for decades. Um, and it's something where the irrigation districts match those funds to a certain defined level. And that is used specifically and exclusively to rehabilitate existing infrastructure. The new announcement that came from uh, um, the federal government and the provincial government, which involves a very large investment um, by the Alberta government, but then also uh, allows the irrigation districts to uh, provide funding uh, both directly and by way of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Uh, that announcement is focused on expanding irrigation efficiencies and expanding irrigation acres in this province. So it is two-pronged. There will be uh, new acres coming on stream. And that goes back to uh, my discussion there. Of what do we do in the event of uh, um, you know, a low water year? And that is, you know, we need to focus on improving our efficiency and we need to focus on capturing and storing the water that is available more effectively. So that would be the building of new dams and reservoirs and uh, focusing on, on uh, improvements in efficiency. So that funding announcement will have a two-pronged approach of um, um, increasing efficiency by way of increasing pipelines, uh, some rehabilitation work, but also focused on the storage component of it. So when you think of uh, emerging technologies that will continue to improve water efficiency, what do all three of you think of? And how long before those technologies might appear in Alberta? 
I'll, I'll jump in here. So um, we're working closely with uh, uh, individuals and researchers at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, we're looking at underground drip irrigation. Uh, obviously, we've, we've seen tremendous um, uh, efficiency gains through use of low pressure nozzles, very variable frequency drives for pivots, um, uh, GPS enabled spot irrigation so that, uh, you know, water is uh, applied at a different rate in the low spot than at the high spot. And all these things will reduce uh, overall water consumption while not negatively affecting yield, if anything, probably positively affecting yield. So, you know, we can certainly do a lot more uh, with a lot less water uh, based on what we see coming down the pipeline. It does require investment. It requires investment by the farmer, um, but it also requires investment by the irrigation districts themselves. But a lot of the stuff that perhaps is, uh, uh, let's say the low hanging fruit is converting ditches to pipelines and so forth to uh, prevent uh, a seepage and evaporation. Uh, you know, now we're getting to the point where more significant will be investment will be required in order to get those same returns on water use efficiency. And those will be borne mainly by the farmer themselves. Jason or Wim, do you have any comments on the subject? No, I think that covers it pretty well. Sometimes I think to better forecasting, which is difficult in this part of the province, because sometimes you see heavy rains and the sprinkler is still going, but better forecasting at times too is probably uh, a good practice, uh, something that we can look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the deployment of, of technology is one of the key aspects here in, in terms of forecasting and planning and assessment around these things, and also monitoring in-stream uh, in issues whether it's quality issues or, or quantity issues, I think that should go hand in hand with, with the increased efficiency. Now, I don't know who would be uh, best to answer this one, but is river water considered a provincial resource such as oil, gas, and gravel? And if so, do irrigation farmers in effect pay a royalty to Alberta? And if so, what is the amount of the royalty? I can jump in here. The, the, so the Crown claimed ownership many, 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 many decades ago in terms of uh, ownership of the water under the legislation. Um, there isn't, obviously there's a variety of costs with diversions of water in terms of power and everything else, uh, but there is not a, a specific royalty on water. I mean, there's some jurisdiction in, in Canada that have gone down that route, but we don't have that in Alberta. Okay. So Perhaps if I may just uh, augment that, and I think Jason, you, you summed that up very well. Um, however, uh, one thing I do want to add is that um, for the irrigation districts, we uh, uh, utilize primarily uh, snow melt, which is brought down uh, to this uh, part of the country by the left bridge and Medicine Hat area by way of a main canal and, uh, and tributary canals. And for anybody to use that water, they not only have to purchase the water rights themselves, uh, from the irrigation district, um, but also pay uh, an annual uh, water water fee. So that, in a way, is akin to a royalty payment. So in 12 of the 13 districts, um, the EID being the only exception, uh, the uh, the farmers pay an annual fee based on the amount of acres they irrigate. And uh, another question that we had come in is, do you see this number inflating over the next few years? Like how, how much different do you see it in the next five years going forward? So, so speaking from the irrigation district perspective again, yes. So we've, uh, we've seen in the last five years um, in our district, it's increased about 20%. Uh, I know other districts have had greater increases than that. Um, but you know, given, given the, um, the uh, fact that a lot of the infrastructure is aging and will require investment, given uh, the fact that, uh, um, you know, we are uh, pursuing uh, efficiency drives on the irrigation district level, those will all need to be funded uh, and mainly funded by the farmers. So I expect that across the board among all the districts over, over the near future, those, those fees will continue uh, to, to increase. So another question here, this is probably uh, geared towards you, Alex. Um, why is more storage needed if water use is going down within irrigation districts? So, so I think Wim covered that really uh, well in his presentation as well. And it is really the 
uncertainty, and, uh, and Jason mentioned this as well, uh, the uncertainty of the impact of climate change. Uh, severe uh, weather events will impact us. Uh, even uh, events like the uh, forest fires around Waterton Park uh, have a direct impact on water availability in so far that uh, the snow melt uh, happened at a much different rate than it would if there would have been tree cover. So as you know, you have more severe weather events, as you have a more um, or a less predictable uh, melt of the existing snowpack, uh, those are all things that can send um, perhaps a less predictable amount of water down the system, possibly at inopportune times. You know, the water primarily uh, comes our way in June and our heaviest uh, demand is in July. So we need to be able to capture it and store it um, so that we can use it later in the, in the growing season. So the, the water availability and the need for water uh, do not uh, occur at, at the same time. And I could add to that, but uh, imagine uh, if you have a wet year where storage is not essential for irrigation needs, uh, multi-purpose reservoir, as an example, upstream of Calgary would always be drawn down prior to the spring flooding, starting in about the middle of May and then June and early July. So drawing down the reservoirs for the annual flood period would benefit all the users and would benefit the river systems downstream in those years when perhaps all the water is not required downstream by users. So it's got a, a benefit every year, whether or not it's used by irrigation or other users. Jason, anything you'd like to add or do you feel like Wayman and Alex covered it? Um, no, I, I'm, I, I was thinking more on the resources. I had the previous question in terms of resourcing, but um, if I could just add there, I think there's, a, there's some question marks about how we resource monitoring and, and uh, analysis of, of our watershed management more generally. Uh, and so the budgets related to irrigation infrastructure and everything is, is one piece of the puzzle, but how we resource and budget for, for watershed management more broadly is, is a essential question that I think needs answering. So, so I went back to, <laughs> to another answer. Absolutely. Um, so this is an interesting question that came in here. It says, there seems to be a lack of alignment in the views presented here today as well. Well, everyone has different opinions and uh, as well as generally when it comes to talking about what to do about an uncertain future. Do any of you guys have suggestions on how we can reconcile these differences and how we can work together without agendas acting as barriers? I guess my take on it is that uh, I'm a little more optimistic with respect to our alignment. I, I listened to Jason's uh, presentation and you know, I agree with what Jason's saying. There, there is uncertainty. There is no question in my mind as an irrigator uh, that environmental considerations uh, are paramount. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no doubt, you know, as farmers and as irrigators, we don't run our business um, for you know, immediate uh, returns. You know, we're not judged on a, on a quarterly return as, as a stock market is. You know, these are family farms that go on for generations. Um, so sustainable water use is, is key. And that is impossible to achieve without taking environmental considerations into account, working with the Environmental Law Center, working with Alberta Environment, et cetera. Yeah, and just as a couple of comments, I think we're not that far apart in terms of the objectives. And if you look at some of the individual water licenses, as I mentioned before, there have been periodic significant changes in the water licenses. The moratorium was a very significant change in 2006. So uh, changes do occur and will continue to occur in response to conditions and response to needs. And needs vary from time to time. Uh, one of the things that I could even see is uh, maybe a, 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 an agreement by the province that every 10 years a task force gets together and say, okay, here's the global changes we think are or are not appropriate at this time, whether it be on the Water Act or whatever aspect of water management we can talk about. Yeah, I, yeah. well, I think there's, there's a need to, I think the challenge will be is that we have, we're faced with a regulatory system where um, a lot of the, the the allocation in the south for sure is through deemed licenses and the and the kind of 
the ability to flexibly respond kind of to in-stream flow kind of needs of, of other species is, is where it's going to be challenged. Um, it's not going to be easy. And, and I think that's where I think the environmental law center is saying, well, how can we become more adaptive in, in mm -hmm. our management system to reflect those and create accountability for the in-stream flows rather than, um, deferring the risks to the environment as we do now. So I think there is the option there, opportunity there. I think, again, the challenge is when we're intensifying the use for, from some of these decisions is that are we, are we giving ourselves less flexibility and less opportunity to respond? Um, we're kind of perhaps embedding a reliance on a specific water use. And when the low flows do come, uh, how are we going to respond to that? So that's the, really the challenge I see. I wonder if I could just add a couple of things on that. I'm looking at the EID water license and clause number eight. Uh, the license is based on knowledge available at the time of issue and therefore the controller reserves the right to amend a number of different factors. So that's already built into licenses number nine, which is even stronger to protect the aquatic environment. The licensee shall reduce the rate of water diversion or cease diverting when ordered by the controller. So I have, you know, overall as a province and as a public, we see the need to change licenses. We see the need to do something different, whether it be for in-stream flow needs or for whatever. Certainly there is a flexibility in the licenses and the fact that it went from 100 to 400 cubic feet per second downstream of Bassano is one example of uh, amendments to reflect realities and change perception of what is needed. I think that the difficulty, though, is is practically speaking, implementing or having the the government have, make those hard decisions, are are perhaps uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if they'll happen. So far, in terms of in-stream objectives, we kind of look to uh, suspending temporary diversion licenses and then voluntary measures. So, which is fair enough, but I think I think there's some challenges in, even in a practical level of whether we we can rely on the government to make tough choices like that. And perhaps we could do a better job if we collaborate more and, and rather than relying on the, on the government deciding it. But, you know, I think Jason could probably comment on the number of times, even in recent years that uh, you've had to reduce withdrawals from the river during very dry periods. And certainly that even happens in the municipal level. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a, a broader question of how we manage the watershed and, and how how we all take responsibility for it, right? And so it's an integration of, of governance systems that I think is, is probably needed to scale up. There's a second question in here that, or a question that came uh, in regards to the second uh, announcement that uh, was made towards irrigation. Do individual irrigation districts have acres identified to be the targets of those new irrigated acres in the second announcement? And what would be the process to identify new areas to irrigate? So the, uh, the process would in, in all likelihood be, and it's, uh, you know, there are 13 districts, not all of them will be impacted by uh, uh, this announcement, but the majority are. Uh, how each district will handle that uh, will de be dependent on the district. But I think uh, generally it is safe to uh, generalize and conclude that uh, there are dry land acres that are currently uh, um, existing in, in, their, uh, in their area that would be, uh, um, I guess, uh, available for, for irrigation. So they, the factors to consider is the quality of the land, whether or not the land is suitable for irrigation, uh, the proximity to existing irrigation infrastructure, um, and uh, um, the availability to service that. Um, but no, it would not be a question of uh, taking uh, grassland uh, and converting it to irrigated acres. So this is, these are acres that are currently being farmed that uh, are assessed to be suitable for irrigation. The Blue River Irrigation District did an expansion a couple of years ago at the present the EID prior to this announcement did have a proposal in front of all their farmers to vote yay or nay with respect to a specific increase in acreages, still maintaining their licenses. So that was already happening even before this announcement. 
And a question here, um, is the Canada Infrastructure Bank funding to be paid back by the ir irrigation districts or is it a grant? So right now we're, we're not uh, getting into the details on this because we, uh, we're working closely with them. Uh, but uh, when, uh, when the Canada Infrastructure Bank is involved, it's fair to say that that component is not a grant. So it is a bank that makes loans available for infrastructure development. Absolutely, okay. Um, we have time for a couple more questions here. We're very quickly running out of time. Um, so here's a question um, for Jason. Do you know whether AI is being programmed to manage for sustainability? Um, good question. I think there's a lot of, uh, opportunity there. And I think that's probably something where the government should look in investing as well in terms of using AI as a, uh, for purposes of monitoring and evaluating ecosystem health. Um, that's an area where certainly I, that's not my area of expertise, but I, I would think that either, I mean, we, we've seen how remote sensing has increased in its relevance in terms of land management over time. So I, I would think AI would play a role there. Um, and I think that's part of the part of the piece of the puzzle is is the monitoring aspect and how we are able to monitor effectively and, and use that monitoring to assess and plan our future directions. And uh, Wim, we have a question here for you. Um, was there a reason for the increase to 400 CFS in 2002? I don't know the specific reason for that. Okay. Like I suspect it definitely was because of in-stream flow needs. The lower Bow River can certainly get quite warm there with warm temperatures. So it would have been in-stream flow needs impact on aquatic habitat. I'm quite sure it, it does. Uh, you know, bring up the value of, uh, I think when we go ahead and look at storage, whether it be for flood control, well, flood control for a city of Calgary has to be a storage upstream. A storage upstream can release water as needed for irrigation, as I indicated. Upstream too is going to be less evaporation and less issues with water temperatures for fish. And so I think it has a number of different benefits. Okay, awesome. Well, unfortunately, we, we are out of time, but it was great having all three of you on here on the panel today, Jason, Wim, and Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, we would not be able to do this without you. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. You guys uh, are the reason we're here. So it's always great to uh, be able to have people that are willing to listen and ask questions about ag because it is an ever-changing industry and we really appreciate your interest. So once again, thank you. And uh, please keep an eye on your inbox for a follow-up email and future webinars, which will be announced soon. So keep an eye on your email. And if you have any questions, you can always email us. So thanks again, everyone, and take care. Have a great Tuesday. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you.